minimize that so we get more. Oh, somebody else will. Be able to see what's still here. Are we ready? It is seven o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Let's call the Johnson City Council meeting number 23-04, the order. Uh, Sam, roll call, please. Cope. Here. Burkhart. Here. Martin. Here. Evans. Here. Ready. I want to welcome everyone that is in the audience this evening. If you are here for an item on the agenda, we would ask you to wait for that item to come up to address the council at that time. If you're here for an item that is not on the agenda, there'll be an opportunity under public communications to address the council. The next item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. Who have I not picked on? Have Council members, have you all? Mayor, I'd love to do it. So there you I'd go. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank, Thank you, Councilman Burkhardt. Thank you for the opportunity. The next item on the agenda is the agenda approval. Do we have any changes to the agenda? Okay. Council, any changes? Seeing none, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Sam Bolt, please. Burkhart? Yes. Martin? Yes. Evans? Yes. Cope? Yes. Ready. Motion passed. Moving on to public communications. We have one public, uh, scheduled public communication this evening, and that is to uh, present the ETC Institute Leading the Way Award. And Janet, are you gonna tell us about? I am, but we also have Jason from ETC who's on Zoom. Oh, we'll okay. Chat in, but um, so in last spring, we did the community survey. Um, and we received an award, a Leading the Way Award. And so I will turn it over to Jason with ETC Institute. Um, he's our account rep, and he can talk a little bit more about why Johnson received this award from the community survey results. Great. Thanks, Janet. <clears throat> My name is Jason Morado. I'm the Director of Community Research at ETC Institute. And today I would like to recognize the City of Johnson for winning the Leading the Way Award for the second time. Johnson first won the award when we conducted your survey in 2020, and ETC Institute has been conducting community surveys for city and county governments for over 40 years. And in 2020, we finally decided that we should create an award that recognizes the highest performing communities all across the country. So in 2020, we created the Leading the Way Award. And this award recognizes local governments who rate in the top 10% of all local governments across the country in three core areas of ETC Institute's Direction Finder Survey, which is our community survey. Those three core areas are how satisfied residents are with the overall quality of services that are provided by the city, how satisfied residents are with the customer service that's provided by city employees, and how satisfied residents are with the value they receive for local taxes and fees. <clears throat> when we conducted the City of Johnson's Community Survey last year, not only did you rate above the national average in all 41 areas that we assessed on the survey, but you also rated in the top 10% of all communities across the country in those three core areas that I mentioned. So therefore, the city of Johnson is a well-deserved, now two-time winner of the Leading the Way Award. So once again, congratulations to the mayor, city council, city manager, and all city staff on your outstanding accomplishments. This really is an award that everyone should be proud of. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. 
Jason. Jason, well, thank you for joining us this evening. We, uh, you know, I think I said this last year when you presented the award to us last year, you know, we, we, uh, we know that we have a great community here. We know we have wonderful residents here and we know that, uh, you know, our staff uh, does an incredible job of providing services to our residents. We're always proud when we get the survey results back. And uh, so many of the, the results show us in the 80 and 90 percentile, some of them as high as 97 percentile in terms of uh, the services that we provide. Um, and so we are really proud to receive this award once again, I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, there, there we go. But I think that uh, you know, it's it it. I, I think it's a it's a, it's a great representation of the, you know, the great staff that we have here, the great quality of service that they provide to our residents, and the fine city council that we have, that uh, you know that uh, develops great policy to uh, you know to provide those services to our residents and, and to support our staff in doing so. So again, thank you so much. Uh, I wish you were here to have the, your picture taken with us, but we're gonna go ahead and have our picture taken if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah sounds, sounds good to me. Great job, everyone. The council wants to come down here and join me. I haven't dressed up for this. <laughs> no. I'm proud to stand by you. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did it look like this? Yeah, and yeah. yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Good friends. <laughs> Or just pump iron and pump crystal. Yeah. Yeah. Whoops. Thank you again, Jason, uh, for being with us this evening and for all of your good work on, on helping us with oh. the survey and, and uh, coming up with the results. So really appreciate your good work. Yeah, absolutely. Once again, congratulations. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay. That was the only scheduled item that we have under public communications. Is there anyone in the audience that would uh, like to address the council on an item that is not on the agenda? Seeing none. Sam, do we have anybody online? No. Okay, thank you. We will move on then to public hearings and we have several public hearings this evening. The first is to conduct a public hearing on the authorization of a loan and disbursement agreement and the issuance of notes to evidence the obligation of the city thereunder and approval of resolution number 23-39, a resolution instituting proceedings to take additional action. And we will open this public hearing at 7.08. Matt. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Uh, the purpose of this loan is to pay for the costs of acquisition, construction, extending, improving all of the parts of our municipal water utility, including those costs associated with the Northwest Annexation Area Water Service Extension Project. Uh, this hearing will give uh, you the authority to borrow up to 24 million to fund constructions of segment A, B, C, as well as a future water tower. Um, the council will only issue the amount that is actually needed to complete each project. So there will be um, a borrowing at each segment. We won't borrow the money all at once. So just as we kind of progress along through that project, be happy to answer any questions. So council, have any questions for Matt? Matt, I actually want to direct a question, I think, through you to Teresa, if she is, uh, oh, there she is. back there. Um, how does this obligation impact uh, bonding in general uh, with regard to the city's finances? 
Um, Matt obviously indicates that we aren't actually borrowing this money until we need it for each segment. But when we approve this type of resolution, does this uh, in any way negatively impact our, our borrowing or, or what kind of rates we might see because of it? Not for this type of loan, because this is a revenue financing loan. So it is um, based solely on the utility revenue funds to have paid it. It has nothing to do with our property taxes. Fantastic. So it does not affect our um, our full max, uh, our full valuation limit that we can't be over. Thank you very well, much. Any other questions for Matt or for Teresa? So Matt, when you it, in the on the mat that you have, it shows um, like a dollar amount for construction, and then in the, another not a dollar amount for total project. Can you just talk a little bit about? Yeah. So the what the total what's included in the total project that isn't included in the construction. Yeah. So the the total project cost is the engineering acquisition if we have to purchase any property to extend that water main um, as well as obviously the construction dollars rolls into that as well so that's engineering and design that uh, is the difference between those two numbers primarily Matt, are these today's dollars or do we somewhat try to project out albeit very difficult I know right now? inflationary costs? These are projected um, future costs. However, that's if you look at the dollar amount that's on here, we are slightly above that to give us a little bit of flexibility okay. with the volatility in the market today. Also suggest just looking at this map, so it has kind of a cross hatched, um, which is identified as the 2017 target annexation service area. And obviously, given some of the, uh, the settlement that we reached with Xenia, um, that that probably is needs to be adjusted to reflect that. Yeah, we'll get. I, I've asked for an updated map, so we can. We'll have that next time. Oh, I'm sorry. It isn't. Sorry about that. Any other questions for Matt? If not, this is a public hearing on this item. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to address the council? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing at 713. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 23-39? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Cindy or Sam, vote please. Cope. Yes. Martin. Yes. Burkhart. Yes. Evans. Yes. Motion passed. Item 4B, conduct a public hearing for the 23-24 proposed property tax levy and consider resolution number 23-40, City of Johnston, Iowa approval of the 2023-2024 maximum property tax dollars. $15,244,076. And we'll open this public hearing at 714. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, so in 2019, the state legislature passed Senate File 634. Uh, this was uh, a bill that was with the aim of adding transparency to city and county property taxes. Uh, this legislation did two main things. First, it added a uh, public notification about city and county property tax collections and an additional public hearing. And this, that hearing is this evening. Uh, second, it required budgets to be approved by a two thirds supermajority when property tax collections in certain categories exceeded 2% over the previous tax years collections. Now the public, uh, the public notice was only though on part of the property taxes collected by the city, and that is a requirement of the new law. So notably, the debt service levy is excluded from the required public hearing notices. Uh, additionally, the levies impacted by the 2% threshold uh, in the city's proposed budget are the regular general and the employee benefits levy. Uh, Johnston's notice for the public hearing on the proposed city maximum property tax dollars for the 2023-2024 budget was published on February 8th of 2023 and posted on the city's social media sites as required by the code. 
Now, one complicating factor in this year's budget is was legislative uncertainty. Um, particularly, you may know with Senate File 181, uh, that legislation itself was actually approved by the legislature and signed yesterday by the governor. Uh, due to that uncertainty, and we knew that pending legislation was out there, uh, the city did publish the proposed notice uh, for both the regular and the emergency levels at their maximum amounts of 810 and 27 cents, along with the needed employee benefit levy. Now, the city does not intend uh, to approve the final budgets at these rates, but rather uh, due to that legislation and other legislation that's moving through the process, this allows the city to react uh, to them through our budget process. Now, this was uh, in part recommended by the Department of Management that we needed to continue our budget process even with uh, the legislative uncertainty that was out there. Uh, so as published, the maximum property tax notice uh, that was published, the city would receive an FY 2024 $15,244.76 or $2.2 million or a 16.94% increase. Now again, we're not intending to collect that. Um, and since this is the public hearing on the proposed uh, maximum property tax dollars, city staff is recommending that the final uh, maximum property tax dollars received in FY 2024 be set at 13 million 916 310 or an increase of eight hundred and eighty thousand six hundred and forty seven dollars or six point seven five percent over FY 2023. Now I would note as I said earlier that does ex exclude the debt service levy um, and the 13 point $9 million is the amount that's included in the proposed resolution that's before uh, the city council for your consideration this evening. Now, based on uh, the maximum property tax dollars that's being considered tonight and due to the changes, and we're still trying to anticipate that, we've not received final values from uh, the county on how that will fully be implemented. Uh, so we're, we're estimating those and, and under the legislation that was uh, passed, uh, the county still has an additional two weeks to provide us those final dollar amounts. Um, we're projecting at FY 2024 levy rate will now need to be in, uh, increased to $10.98. I would note that is a difference from what was in the staff memo of 1105. Uh, as staff continues to work on this, we're refining those numbers all the time. Now for a home that is valued at $100,000, a homeowner city property taxes uh, could increase by 3.8% or $22.25 a year. Uh, now, it's important to remember that the city council has the ability to lower uh, the, the amount uh, when they adopt the final budget, but that would be the, the maximum we're projecting a homeowner would, would see. Now, after the public hearing and consideration of all council or comments, excuse me, the council may approve the proposed property tax levy uh, or decrease the amount that's presented tonight, but they cannot increase the levy amount. Uh, the public hearing and approved resolution for the maximum property tax levy is a required step before we set the public hearing on the entirety of the 2023-2024 budget. Uh, so the recommendation that staff would make to the council this evening is to hold the public hearing so the council can take the needed uh, public comments and consideration and then consider approval of a resolution setting the 2023-2024 maximum property tax dollar uh, at $13,916,310. And, and that amount, again, excludes the uh, debt service levy. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions the council has this evening. Thank you. Does the council have any questions for Mike? So, uh, Mike, um, in the, the document, the so I'm looking at the notice of the public hearing proposed property tax levy. And in the explanation, it talks about um, the 6.75% increase over FY23. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, um, is that, that and that's sort of, and that was obviously based upon sort of discussions that we had as part of a work session, an open work session back in January, where we yeah. talked about hiring an additional police officer, additional, doing some additional uh, uh, decision packages to to address sort of what we felt were important needs in the city. So that that drives a little bit of that 6.75%, but also kind of the, what some of the inflationary numbers that you shared with us as part of that time. Can you walk us through some of the different 
um, kind of cost drivers that we're seeing as a city, um, both kind of in the Midwest and some of the other numbers you yeah. pulled together? Um, you know, it, obviously, you know, our budget process is a long process. Um, and, you know, the council spent a lot of time talking through strategic planning on what those priorities were for the upcoming year. Uh, and so in particular, there was a, there was a number of, of decision packages. So the backup and for the really the public standpoint, you know, the city always looks at kind of a zero based budget every year. Um, and then as uh, various items come forward of, of needs like additional police officers, uh, those are pre presented in the council kind of weighs each of those options. And, and that's ultimately uh, some of the work the council did. Um, but but there are inflationary drivers, and and if I could get a chart shown, um, and in the charts that I presented or sent to you, Cindy, I think it's the second chart in the group. Um, so this was a, a chart that we included in the um, packet uh, to the council, and it really shows some different inflationary impacts. Uh, so the the first one is the consumer price index urban Midwest, um, and it shows from 2018 through 2022 uh, what that has done year over year. Um, and, and again, this is really what we're seeing in our homes of what those inflationary increases and in impacts are. Um, you know, and it, it really deals with consumer goods, a little bit of energy prices. Um, but again, we all are kind of going through the, the that in our own home budgets. Um, but there, there's other inflationary impacts that cities have that are that are really unique impact. And if you think about uh, the bonding, for example, a second ago we talked about with, with water, uh, that would be under the construction um, uh, cost index, uh, which is the third one there. And you can see that you know that's that's consistently generally been uh, well over uh, the consumer uh, price index. And and then you go to the last line. You know, again, we deal with a lot of roads. Uh, the Iowa DOT puts out a, a cost index and, you know, 2018, it went up 45%, 2019, 22%. We've seen a slight decline in 2020, uh, 2021, it was again, 2.9, but then we had another 23.5%. So the cumulative impact of that has been uh, really impactful to the, the city of Johnston and, and other cities like us and counties. So, uh, you know, we we are are definitely seeing uh, inflationary impacts here at the city. And so, and obviously the other, I think kind of, so we have these additional needs that we're funding, whether it be a police officer, firefighters, uh, additional, fun, uh, I believe we increase, we're planning to increase wages for library staff because of this, those have gotten kind of significantly not competitive. And, and so it's making it challenging. So those were, that's part of it. Then the inflation is driving the other part, which kind of helps lead to the 6.75%. And I think the other question I've got is then, so that's kind of the spending side on the sort of the property tax side. So you have kind of, everybody has their, if you're a homeowner, you have a home and it's a, the, you get assessed, Every two years, the the county sort of puts an assessed value on that, yes. and then so for year one, let's say the assessed value is two hundred thousand dollars, and then in year two, it is still two hundred thousand, right? Yep. And so we are in a year two. The budget year we're planning for right now is in year two of that, correct? So every, so every, while there's been a lot of media stories about higher assessed valuations, that's that won't kick in until um, the budget year that we'll be dealing with at this time next year. Correct. And, right? and, and, and probably to your point, too, the median house value in Johnston uh, between last year and this year actually declined slightly by like $20. And so... Um, and that's the assessed value, the full value, not the taxable after the rollback. Uh, and so, yeah, this is not a year where we've seen increases in property values through that revaluation process. And then obviously then, then so you have the assessed valuation again, 200,000, and then you, then you, then you have what's called the residential rollback, which yep. the Senate file 181 changed that. So when we were working under a budget process, we had the expectation that the residential rollback was going to be. 56.49%. Yep. So you would pay 200,000 times 56% would be your taxable valuation. Correct. So then 
because of that legislation, it lowered that percentage, made it about the same rollback percentage as what it was in year one of that assessed value. So for most people, your taxable value should be really pretty similar in Absolutely. year two, what it is for year one, right? Because Absolutely. it's because the assessed value didn't change and the rollback percentage is going to be, I haven't looked it up, but it's 54% and change for both years. Perfect. So so that number isn't being impacted by either inflation or um, any of these other factors. It's kind of frozen based on kind of the assessment process that exists in Iowa. Is that accurate statement? Very accurate. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. My <clears throat> piggybacking on Councilmember Cope's question, the, the infographic that has been distributed as well as uh, provided up here on the dais for us uh, does indicate that a uh, $100,000 home would see an increase of 3.8%. Is, is, um, is that different than what Councilmember Cope is saying that the actual value would not change much or yes. this is the real dollar change yeah, so it's slide 15 in this. Um, and so this, this is the snippet I think you're talking about. Um, so the, the value of the home, like the, the taxable value, that's not changing. What that 3.8% that increase in, in taxes is really a factor of we're increasing our tax levy request or task or tax asking request in real dollars. Um, now some of that were is being offset by new value that's coming online. And then some of it is is simply an a increase in the tax asking that the city is making. Thank you. And and just for clarification's sake, the city is in essence asking for 880,647 new dollars. Correct. And over half of that amount is because of legislation that was just signed yesterday, um, which in essence reduced what we were expecting to get in our property taxes as we were leading up to this point in the budget process. Yes. And, and I think one of the decision points the council is going to have to make is, you know, ultimately, what is that levy rate going to be? Now, if the council wants to leave the levy rate unchanged from last year, you know, that's where we'll see that decline of almost $500,000. Um, now, if the council as kind of direction up to this point was, no, we, we need to focus on the dollars we need to operate the city, that's where you're going to see that slight increase uh, that does translate uh, to the residential property. If you go to slide, uh, well, this is probably getting too much of a new search, uh, but uh, slide three uh, does show uh, kind of pre-Senate, um, well, I have it labeled Senate Sunny Bill 50, or 1056. Uh, can you zoom in some more, just the top part? You know, before that uh, Senate file 181 was approved, you know, property taxpayers, residential homeowners would see about a 5% increase. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, that's where you see that 3.9 or the 3.85% uh, increase or 3.8% increase. Thank you. Yep. Other questions for Mike? So Mike, I'm just looking through the attachments through board docs and yep. these slides are not attached. Yeah, some of these we just put together today. Okay, so if you could maybe after yep, the meeting. We can do that. And then also it would be great to post it on board docs so that there's public availability yep. of it too. Um, and then secondly, uh, um, uh, so obviously, so we, I can't, back in, it was in January, or I think it was in January when we had our work session, might've been late December, where we kind of set kind of this plan in place and, setting the levy at $10 and 75 cents. And again, that was based upon the expectation of a rollback at 56%. So then right. that has changed. Um, and so, um, so we have this process tonight where we set sort of the max levy and on the infographic, it kind of indicates the intent uh, at our first meeting in April, April 3rd, that we would have a budget hearing where we would finalize the budget. We would finalize the property tax amount. I guess I would like for us to 
um, make sure that we have a good opportunity to thoroughly review um, all of our options again, as it relates to you know um, uh, the lost numbers. I know when we had the meeting back in January, we had a couple of different spreadsheets on lost. I would like to see a final where we are on that as what we're projecting in the budget. Would also like to see um, uh, you know kind of a, another maybe updated budget memo that reflects that, and then maybe have an opportunity to distribute that and maybe have an opportunity to visit about those options and then have a, a work session again prior to April 3rd so that we, I don't feel at this point as if there's been a complete kind of discussion about landing on the, the 1105 or 1098. It's been, it's been very informal and that's somewhat satisfactory, but I think we need to have a more robust discussion of that. Um, and and so would request that we engage in that process um, prior to the April third meeting. We're happy to do that. We'll we'll schedule it for a work session in March. Right. Thanks, Councilman Cope. I think for one thing, I want to make sure we get the number from the county before we schedule that meeting. Oh, of course. Yes. Yes. Exactly. And the nice that is the one, and, and that's I know you know the Senate file 181 by pushing back the the date that we're able to certify now allows us. Whereas typically we would probably, this April 3rd meeting would typically probably occur in our first council meeting in March, presumably. And so now we're able to push that back. But yeah, you want to, let's, let's make sure we have all the facts and all the data. But I'm a little uncomfortable saying tonight, hey, it's going to be $10.98 yeah. when we don't have all the data. And I think we need to make sure we're thoroughly reviewing all those things because I, I just don't think we're quite there yet. I'm yeah. not I'm not prepared to sign anything tonight. Absolutely. So. And, and again, tonight is simply setting exactly. the dollars. It's not so setting that levy rate. Setting the max levy. Correct. The max dollars, not even the final. What correct. Right. Right. Other questions for Mike? If not, this is a public hearing on this item. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to address the council? You want to step forward to the podium? Give us your name and address. Address? Address, yes. Uh, my name is uh, Jim DeCrieff. I live at 5633 Rittgers Court here in Johnston. Um, first of all, I want to say, uh, Madam Mayor and distinguished members of the uh, council, I want to thank you for your service and commitment to the city of Johnston. Um, I have lived in Johnston for almost 16 years. I am a volunteer budget counselor and a chapter leader for the Association of Mature American Citizens. If you don't know who that is, we can talk some time, but basically we represent a uh, senior population on a variety of different issues, much like AARP. But I'm not here in an official capacity. What I'm here to say is with all due respect, I'm here to oppose the proposed increased property tax levy. As someone who works with people's budgets and alongside our senior citizens, the proposed tax levy and property taxes in general places additional burdens on seniors' budgets. Now, I wanted to be prepared and I literally spent hours putting something together that I thought sounded good and it would make sense. After listening to all the discussions and things tonight, really for our seniors, what it comes down to, I live in Johnston. When I get my property tax bill, it either goes up or it stays the same. When it goes up, that price is an additional strain on my budget. When I was working and I was a full-time working for corporate America, the percentage of my property tax to my income wasn't that big of a deal to me. But as I slow down and take an early retirement, that percentage of property taxes becomes a much larger portion of my income. Now, we've got a great city here, and I appreciate all that we've had. But when you look at where the city is going, where the county is going, I just want to ask that when you make any decision, and when it comes to budgets or anything like that, that you were voted on by all citizens of Johnston, not just those that want all the nice and new amenities, and we do appreciate them.
but as a senior citizen, I'm probably not going to use most of any of them. But what I am concerned about is being able to stay in my house in Johnston. I worked hard to get my house paid for in my working career. And now I look at my property tax bill and say, what does that mean to me as a percentage of my income and the ability to continue to say, listen, I'm getting a return on my investment because that's what I consider it. I'm investing in the city of Johnston by living here. So with that being said, I just would ask a couple of questions. As a budget counselor, when someone runs into a, a, an issue where their expenses exceed their income, the first question I ask them is, where can we make some cuts? I don't know all the ins and outs of what you've looked at and I need to be more attuned to that, but I would ask that question. What measures have been taken to reduce our spending? I learned a lot here tonight and I wanna thank you for that. So let me just say in conclusion, we all struggle with inflation, with the higher cost of living or doing business. The difference is as a taxpayer, I have to make tough decisions on where and how I spend my dollars. I have to live within my means. I ask you to do the same and consider all residents of Johnston and the, incap, in, excuse me, and the impact of the increased property tax levy will have. I wanna thank you for listening and wish you all a blessed evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jerry Flint. I live at 6701 Augustine Court, and I've been a resident of Johnson for a while. I'm going to talk to you in two uh, phases here, one as a small business owner and one as a property owner here in Johnston. First of all, thank you for your service, as the gentleman uh, just said, but I also op oppose what you're proposing here. As a small business owner, uh, our business was located in West Des Moines. We had the opportunity to relocate that business and a couple of our partners who also live in Johnston, we looked at properties in Johnston, but we couldn't afford it. A lot of it because of the taxes and the tax base here in Johnston. We ended up relocating that business to the East Village. So you should be concerned about that, that we actually wanted to come here, but couldn't because one of the reasons was that the, the tax structure here in Johnson is just too high, not competitive. As a homeowner, what I can tell you is that just as this gentleman said, we've been actively uh, in the community of Johnston. When the uh, inflationary period that we're hitting now, we've cut back. We've turned our, our heat down a couple of degrees in the wintertime. We uh, shop differently, we eat out less, and we've taken a hard look at our expenses. The other thing that I wanna tell you is that we worked hard to try to pay off our property. If this tax increase goes through, our property tax bill will be higher than our mortgage payment. Think about that. Let that settle in for a second. So as a small business owner, couldn't afford it. As a homeowner, you're pricing this out. The other thing, I appreciate your service, but I don't appreciate the fact that you presented information tonight that we didn't have an opportunity to review. So please take that advisement in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, Rob Wood, 6003 Dogwood Circle. Um, just some things that we're coming across my mind as you guys were presenting this uh, tax increase. Um, at work, I work at Farm Bureau uh, Financial Services. And um, every year we wanna know what we are going to be getting as far as an increase to our base pay. And this year it was gonna be two to two and a quarter percent increase. And literally, what you are proposing is gonna wipe that out. I have five kids and I know that there are young families who have just moved in, who unfortunately were at the really high end of the housing market. And I kinda, and I'm coming here to uh, express my concern for their ability to be able to 
to afford to be here. Um, I also came to the sidewalk uh, uh, program presentation about two weeks ago. And, you know, we're talking about 3.8%, but really what you're talking about is if anyone has concrete panels that need to be replaced, let's say on average two, you're actually looking at a property tax increase of probably about 10%. Not just 3.8%. And I, since seeing all of what is going to be considered as replacement, I started going around and saying, oh, that's got to be replaced. And some of these corner lots with these young families, they are going to have a gigantic bill this year. Something that they really should have been to that meeting to understand what exactly was being asked of them. And I know that this is Iowa law, but Consider this fact that this should have been done or that was considered in 2017 to start that program when you were going to ask them to start repairing that on a regular basis. That was put off five years. So in 2019, when things were going really well, I don't understand why that was not asked. So now you have families that have moved in. They bought at the high end of the market, a higher interest rate, and those people who sold them the house did not have those sidewalks repaired. So you can add that on top of what you're asking tonight. And I'm going to tell you, it's, it, they're going to go in deficit. If, they're in great, if their wage increase is 2% this year, which I guarantee that's probably about ballpark average, that could hurt a lot of families. So just consider that what's being asked in total from the council, that there are people who are probably unknowingly living at the edge of their budget, just trying to live the American dream. So I thank you for your service and thank you for listening to me tonight. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to address the council on this item? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing then at 7.42. Does the council have any further questions? I, I wanna respond just to a couple of things that have been said here, but any other questions, council? Well, I just want, first of all, I want to thank everyone that has come this evening. Um, we, you know, we go through this process every year. We spend a lot of time, as, as has already been indicated, working through uh, the budget, trying to, you know, trying to hear what our residents have to say about what, what they believe the services should be, what the needs in the community are, working very hard to, to develop that budget and to keep the proposed property tax levy as low as possible. Uh, we we really struggle with that. I mean, in fact, you know, it sounds funny, but we sit up here and we we wrestle with pennies on on that property tax levy because again, we're we're very committed to keeping the property tax uh, burden on our on our residents as, as and and our and our businesses here in the in the community as as low as possible. We we spend several months doing that. And often we don't get anybody to come to our public hearing. So thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for uh, you know, going out online and looking at some of the information. We'll get the additional information out there so you can take a look at that, that as well. Um, but thank you for being here and, and thank you for sharing your, your thoughts with us. Um, as Mike has already indicated, you know, this is, this is it, the action that we, I expect that we'll take tonight just sets the maximum. Uh, amount that, that we would be looking at um, uh, levying this year. Um, we still have several weeks to talk about the budget. We uh, are going to pay very close attention to what happens at the legislature because they've kind of thrown us a little bit of a curveball this year as we're moving along trying to put a, a budget together. They're, they keep coming up with legislative proposals that we aren't sure how it's going to impact the decisions that, that we make as a uh, as city elected officials, but uh, um, hopefully we're, we, we've got a, a pretty good sense at this point where, where we think that's all gonna go and, and uh, 
can make a, a decision here the first part of April. Um, but we will take into consideration your comments tonight. I mean, we, 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 we hear you and we understand exactly, you know, what, what, what your concerns are, uh, you know, what, what you're sharing as, as the impact on you. And so we want to make sure that, that we are, as we always try to be, as, as, uh, you know, as careful as we can be uh, when we put the budget together and, and, uh, and, and set the property tax levy. There are years that we've reduced the levy and that your property, the city portion of your property taxes have actually gone down. Um, we, don't, we don't usually get thanks for that. And I don't know that people you know, notice when that happens. Um, but again, we're, you know, we, we try and make the best decisions that we can. We try and make good decisions for our residents and the businesses, businesses in our community. And so we will continue to work hard to you know, come up with the best budget that we can, make sure that the services that, that our residents need and, and expect us to provide to them are being delivered to them at the best, best possible uh, price that we can, can uh, deliver those, those services. So um, we'll, we'll, if between now and the time that you know, we, we make some final decisions, you have any additional comments, any suggestions, on you know how we should be making some decisions around this year's budget, please share those with us. You know our our names, our email addresses, our phone numbers are all out on the website. You can get a hold of any of us. Um, and I, I I know these folks up here. I know that they're very conscientious in the job that they do as council members representing you. And so uh, I know that they will all take your calls and have that conversation with you and, and would uh, be more than happy to hear what your suggestions or your concerns are. So again, I just wanna say thank you for coming tonight. And uh, we we hear you, we're listening to you and uh, we will take your, your uh, comments into consideration as we continue to work through this process. Thank you. You bet. Mayor, if I might, I would just add, I mean, I think these were great comments and, I, and the gentleman who was at the sidewalk meeting the other night, I was there as well and, and appreciate the, your feedback that you, you shared with that. I, I think specifically around that, you know, um, one thing that I thought about specifically on that sidewalk meeting, because I think some of it's relevant here is that a lot of those homes, so that the sidewalk area that we're working with is in the Green Meadows neighborhood, right? That's where you live. And a lot of those homes were, I, I'm not as familiar with that neighborhood, but I think those homes were built in, probably in the early 80s or 90s. So these homes have been around for 40 years, right? And those sidewalks went in 40 years ago. And, and they haven't really, there hasn't been a regular city program of maintenance that goes around and says, okay, you got to do something about this sidewalk panel. It's out of whack. So we've gone 40 years without that. And unfortunately, we're now adopting a sidewalk program, which I think is really important. It's great. I think it's, and it, but, and it's going to, I think, get us in a situation where we're going to be going around the city and breaking the city into eight different segments um, and really then reviewing those segments, those city sidewalks instead of once every 40 years, once every eight to 10 years, which I think is going to help really make sure that we have a safe sidewalk network throughout the city which then goes kind of to the a point that the first gentleman made about services that you, that senior citizens or citizens that use in Johnston. And, and as, if you look at our city budget, the number one item in our city budget is public safety. It's not the fancy, I know everybody thinks, oh, it's all these, you're spending money on something fancy that I'm never gonna use. But, but if you're using, if you're using our trail system, if you're if you're if you dial 911 or if you need uh, uh, emergency services to come to your home, those are all part of the services that that we we fund through our city budget, and that really is what drives the budget. And I would encourage all of you, um, uh, as part of this process, the mayor talked about, and it's all out on our on our website. Um, uh, all we have all of our meetings that we held where we reviewed the budget. We had two work sessions, one on December fifteenth. And a number on another one on December 20th, where we work through the whole city budget. We go department by department, and each department head gets up and sort of says, "Here's kind of the state of my agency, and here's what's going well, and here's what I need to work on." Had a, had great presentations, whether it was from the public works department or from Parks and Recreation or the police department or the fire department, saying, 
here's what's going really well with my department, but here's what we need to fix to continue to deliver a great high level of services. And so that's all we, the process we go through. So we had those two meetings on in December, really where we dug in, we spent multiple hours in those meetings and, and it's all available. You can watch it on video. Um, and so I'd encourage you to take a look at that because that gives you a pretty good idea of kind of the state of the city and each of the different state ag city agencies in the city. And then on January 17th, we had a work session uh, spent an, uh, an hour and a half work session. Where, again, it's available on video. But we went through the budget and we went through this whole process where we said, what is it that we think is, you know, what can we afford? What's important? How do we prioritize? Because that's that's what, how you put a budget together. You prioritize and you figure out how to do it. And it's really important. And the, and the second gentleman talked about making sure our property taxes are competitive. And I, and I want to assure you, we work very, very hard to make sure our property tax levy is competitive. So our property tax levy this year going to be on the city side, it's going to be somewhere in the $10 and, and change somewhere. In the city of Des Moines, it's going to be $16. So I don't know how you got a business in East Village cheaper than that, but it's the property taxes in the city of Des Moines are significantly higher than they are here in Johnson. And the communities that we really compete with, the Ankenys, the Urbandales, the Grimes, West Des Moines, we're very competitive with those and we work very, very hard to stay competitive with those. So those are all part of that process that we go through um, and, and try to figure out and, and, and those issues and those concerns. I think if you watch the video from those three meetings, you'll get a sense of just how much, uh, as the mayor pointed out, we really work to try to make sure that we are making those tough decisions because that's what you, you ask and expect us to do. So just wanted to, to share that perspective as well. Any other comments or questions, Council? Mayor and Council, just I would like to point out that we did get the charts that we showed here. They're on board docs now. Oh, great, great, great. Okay, if there isn't any further comments or questions, do we have a motion to approve resolution number 23-40? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Cindy, or Sam, vote please. Pope? Yes. Burkhart? Yes. Martin? Yes. Evans? Yes. Motion passed. Again, thank you for uh, for being here with us this evening, and we look forward to, continue, to continuing to have the conversation with you. Moving on to item 4C, conduct a public hearing on the issuance of not to exceed $8 million in general obligation urban renewal bonds for essential corporate urban renewal purposes and consider resolution number 23-42 instituting proceedings to take additional action for the issuance of not to exceed $8 million general obligation urban renewal bonds. And we'll open this public hearing at 7.53. And Teresa, is this at the point where I read this very long paragraph. All right, yes, it is. Okay, <laughs> bear with me, Council. <laughs> this is the time and place for the public hearing and meeting on the matter of, of the issuance of not to exceed $8 million general obligation renewal bonds of the City of Johnson, State of Iowa, in order to provide funds to pay the cost of aiding in the planning, undertaking, and carrying out of urban renewal projects under the authority of Chapter four, uh, 403 and the urban renewal plans for the East Central TIF urban renewal area, East Central, Northwest 100th Street Economic Development Urban Renewal Area, Northwest 100th, and West Central Urban Renewal Area, West Central, as amended, including opening, widening, extending, grading, and draining of the right-of-way of streets, highways, avenues, alleys, and public grounds, and marketplaces, and the removal and replacement of dead or diseased trees thereon with related utility and site improvements, for the Northwest 62nd Project, East Central, designed for the road to the Kayak Launch, East Central, grading for 5055 Merle Hay Road redevelopment, East Central, 100th Street Project, West Central, and Northwest 100th Street Project, Northwest, Northwest 100th, and the Ignite Public Park improvements, East Central, for urban renewal purposes, and that notice of the proposal to issue the bonds and the right to petition for an election have been published as provided by chapters 384 and 403 of the Code of Iowa. I think that was written by an attorney. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
has a has a petition been filed in a clerk's office as contemplated in section 362.4 of the Code of Iowa, requesting that the question of issuing bonds be submitted to the qualified electors of the city? No. Have there been any written objections filed by any resident or property owner of the city to the issuance of the bonds? No. Did you open the hearing? I should have asked that. Earlier. I opened the public okay. hearing. All right, then um, be, uh, I'll make my comments before you ask if there are any oral okay. objections. And um, uh, as you saw on the agenda this evening, uh, Mayor and Council, there are four public hearings. Um, all of them relate to the 2023-2024 CIP and some residual projects left in the current fiscal year that we're in. Um, 22, 23 that were also in the CIP. Uh, this first hearing has to do with all of the projects that are in, um, occurring in an urban renewal area that we have. And in the staff report, those were listed. The mayor um, just now had to read those to you also out loud. Um, specifically in the East Central District, um, uh, there's the 62nd reconstruction, which is going to be out here to um, um, Beaver Drive. Right. And then um, potentially the road to the kayak launch. Some of these I keep saying potentially because, as I've noted in the staff reports, none of these projects get let or awarded until they come back to you again. So um, please know that even though you're approving this part, that doesn't um, necessarily occur at this point. Um, Merle Hay Gateway uh, redevelopment grading, which is the uh, gateway area is on the um, east side of Merle Hay Road, and then potentially um, public park improvements in the Ignite area itself. Then in the Northwest 100th TIF area, we have um, 100th Street reconstruction, which will be 54th to 62nd. I'm wait, if I'm wrong, Matt's going to correct me, right? Okay, and then the 100th Street in the West Tiff area, which is um, from Northwest 70th to our North City limits. So those are the projects occurring um, based on this particular public hearing and um, all of the urban renewal area projects were included within this hearing. Are there any questions on that? I also ex exclude, excuse me, included um, our tentative calendar, um, for proceedings for all of this um, information. And the hope is that we will uh, close and get our funds on July 5th um, of this year. So that's the hope. So. Do you have any questions for Teresa? If not, this would be the time for receiving any oral or written objections to the issuance of these bonds. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to comment on the issuance of the bonds? If not, we will then close this public hearing at 7.58. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 23-42? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Sambolt, please. Burkhart? Yes. Martin? Yes. Evans? Yes. Cope? Yes. Motion passed. Okay, this is the second in this drill, folks. So just hang on to your seats. I presume some legislator passed the bill requiring Probably. you to read this. You know, I've been, pardon? Do I open the public hearing before I read this first paragraph? I did, so, okay. We will open the public hearing at 7.59. Well, first of all, let's read what we're doing here. Item 7D. Conduct a public hearing on the issuance of not to exceed $2 million general obligation bonds. Consider resolution number 23-43, instituting proceedings to take additional action 
for the issuance of not to exceed $2 million in general obligation bonds, ECP, providing for the publication of notice thereof. We'll open the public hearing at eight o'clock. And I'll begin by reading this statement. This is the time and the place for the public hearing and meeting on the matter of the issuance of not to exceed $2 million in general obligation bonds in order to provide the funds to pay the cost of acquisition, construction, reconstruction, extension, improvement, and equipping of works and facilities useful for the collection, treatment, and disposal of surface, wa surface waters and streams, acquisition, construction, reconstruction, and improvement of all waterways and real and personal property useful for the production or reclamation of property situated within the corporate limits of cities from floods, floods or high waters and for the protection of property in cities for the effects of floodwaters, including the deepening, widening, alteration, change, diversion, or other improvement of watercourses within or without the city limits, the construction of levees, embankment structures, impounding reservoirs, or conduits, and the establishment, improvement, and widening of streets, avenues, boulevards, and alleys across and adjacent to the project, as well as the development and beautification of the banks and other areas adjacent to flood control improvements improvement of parks already owned, including facilities, equipment, and improvements commonly found in city parks, and acquisition of ambulances and ambulance equipment for essential corporate purposes, and that the notice of the proposal to issue the bonds have been published as provided in section 384.25 of the Code of Iowa. Okay, the second hearing then, um, this is the hearing uh, that has to do with the uh, the portion of the debt that would paid for from debt service um, levy and stormwater revenue. If you'll remember mm -hmm. in the CIP this year, there was one storm pro stormwater project. That was a smaller project, $450,000 project that we were gonna include in um, a geo issue. And that's the Royal Park uh, stormwater project. Um, if we have an existing park and we, and we make improvements in an existing park, those are considered essential corporate purposes, which is why it can be included in this one. So the Lou Clarkson um, fin uh, finishing of that master plan and those additions for that park and the Dewey Park improvements were included as well as the ambulance that we have, uh, have had on order for quite some time, frankly. So um, that's what this um, resolution and public hearing is for, if there are any questions. House have any questions for Teresa? Teresa, can you explain? So these are all items that are deemed essential corporate purposes. This one for this hearing. As opposed to items that are not. General corporate general. purposes. General. And can you just explain? So obviously it's good to be on the essential corporate purpose list, right? right? And what, so what is the difference? It, 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 I think if it's not on that list, then the amount that we can spend on that item is limited to 700000 Right. But if it's if it's if it's considered an essential, essential purpose, corporate purpose, then there's no limit to okay. And the parks you you mentioned the parks existing park. So since it's an existing park, improvements Pretty to much. an existing park, you can that's considered an essential corporate purpose. Great, thank you, Teresa. Is is uh, Crown Point uh, not part of a park? Just out of curiosity. Um. Point part of Terra Park. I I I have to I have to check on that. Okay. I also um was just wondering what uh, what's the I'm wondering if I said that wrong if it's the if the dollar amount on these two parks was quite smaller, do you remember, John, what the dollar amount is on the Lou Clarkson project? They were both under 700, but together were they over 700? Yeah, so that's why I think, I'm sure Eric said it's because they're an existing park that I could do that. Okay, Eric so, being the bond. Eric park. Bullock, yeah, I'm sorry. And I would consider Crown Point is not a park. And it's, it, we don't necessarily, Consider it part of Terra Park. It's considered a separate building. I think that's what we were thinking, but um, I can. Go. 
I, if you don't mind, question, yeah. my, I, and if there's some way that perhaps the council wants to discuss designating it as part of the park at some point in time. Other questions for Teresa? Not. Cindy or Sam, have any written objections been filed by any resident or property owner of the city to the issuance of these bonds? No. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to comment on this or make any oral objections to the issuance of these bonds? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing at 8.05. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 23-43? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Sam Bolt, please. Evans. Yes. Cope. Yes. Burkhart. Yes. Martin. Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to item 4E, conduct a public hearing on the issuance of not to exceed $700,000 general obligation bonds. Consider resolution number 23-44, instituting proceedings to take additional action for the issuance of not to exceed $700,000 general obligation bonds. GCP1. This is the time and the place for a public hearing and meeting on the issuance of not to exceed $700,000 general obligation bonds in order to provide funds to pay the cost of the acquisition, construction, reconstruction, enlargement, improvement, and equipping, equipping of, a rec of recreational grounds and parks and the acquisition of real estate, therefore, including water trail connection for general corporate purposes and that notice of the proposal to issue the bonds and the right to petition for an election has been published as provided by section 384.26 of the Code of Iowa. Did I open the public hearing? I can open it. We will open the public <laughs> hearing at 8.07. Okay, great. Now, um, again, this, this one now is a general corporate purpose bond and has to, it specifically is for the water trail connection that's in the CIP um, for 23-24. Sounds like questions for Teresa. None. Have there been any petitions filed requesting that the question of issuing the bonds be submitted to the qualified electors of the city? No. This would be the time when any, or I guess the first question, have any written objections been filed by any resident or property owner of the city to the issuance of these bonds? No. This would be the time for any member of the audience to comment or offer any oral objections to the issuance of these bonds. Would anyone like to do that? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing then at 8.08. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 23-44? Moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Sam Bolt, please. Martin? Yes. Evans? Yes. Cope? Yes. Burkhart? Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to item 4F, conduct a public hearing on the issuance of not to exceed $500,000 general obligation bonds. Consider resolution number 23-45 instituting proceedings to take additional action for the issuance of not to exceed $500,000 general obligation bonds, GCP2. This is the time and the place for the public hearing and meeting on the matter of the issuance of not to exceed $500,000 general obligation bonds in order to provide funds to pay for the costs of the acquisition, construction, reconstruction, enlargement, improvement, and equipping, equipping of a reg, rec, recreational grounds and parks and the acquisition of real estate, therefore, including the new dog park for general, for general corporate purposes, and that the notice of the proposal to issue the bonds and the right to petition for an election have been published, for, uh, provided by section 384.26 of the Code of Iowa. I will open this public hearing at 8.09. 
begin uh, a final hearing on uh, the 23-24 bond um, resolutions. This again is specifically for um, the dog park in, um, but it includes the language about what we may need to do around there, whether it's um, uh, construct, reconstruct, enlarge, improve, uh, whatever it is we need to do, but it, it will be a new, a new park, a new dog park. Any questions for Teresa? None. Have there been any petitions filed requesting that the question of issuing these bonds be submitted to qualified electors of the city? No. Have there been any written objections filed by any resident or property owner of the city to the issuance of these bonds? This would be the time for anyone in the audience to make any comments or offer any oral objections to the issuance of these bonds. Would anyone like to do that? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing then at 811. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 23-45? Uh, so moved. Second. A motion and a second. Further discussion? Sam Vogt, please. Cope. Yes. Burkhart. Yes. Martin. Yes. Evans. Yes. Motion passed. Item 4G, consider resolution number 23-46, adopting plans, specifications, form of contract, and estimate of cost. Resolution number 23-47, making award of construction contract. And resolution number 23-48, approving the construction contract and bond for the construction of the Crown Point Tennis and Pickleball Courts. Good evening, uh, Council, Mayor. Um, oh, yeah. oh, yes. We'll open this public hearing at 8-12. All right, uh, phase one of the overall uh, Crown Point renovation is focusing on the pickleball and the tennis courts that exist there. Um, just a little bit of the history of those courts. They were constructed in the early 80s um, when the overall Crown Point was uh, the community, community center um, for the pioneer area of Green Meadows. Uh, over the course of the last 15 years or so, we have more or less put band-aids over that court knowing the understructure, the subsurface of that court was really kind of deteriorating. Um, we are able to put uh, new coating or new uh, surface on that two different times over the last uh, 12 years, actually. Um, but it's time to uh, change that up completely and, and look at and address the overall issue. At the same time, uh, obviously, uh, everybody here has heard all the requests for more pickleball courts. So starting last fall, we did some public meetings where we had a chance to really reach out to the public and get an input on what they would like to see. Um, could we take a look at the, I have it up here. I did not know that. Uh, in the fall, we, we brought to the public meeting several different options as far as what the design concept could be. Um, this is the, the final um, concept that came forward in November. Um, it was actually unanimously uh, chosen from a group of about, uh, I think there's about 25 to 30 people there at that final meeting, which uh, at any kind of public meeting, when you get unanimous decisions on something, that's pretty strong. So. This is a layout that we're looking at. It, it includes two tennis courts that will be lined only for tennis courts um, and four pickleball courts. Um, the reason for lining them only for tennis is there's a lot of tennis players that argue that the extra lines are a little distracting playing tennis. And uh, the general concept of having four additional pickleball courts opens up a lot more space. Um, just to the north of those, you'll see some benches. There will be actually a shade uh, canopy over top of those benches, uh, which will allow for um, people to be able to view and watch in between games. 
Uh, you can see a retaining wall uh, adjacent to that. That's basically to make sure the topography of the ground that we're not having to dig into the hill and take out a bunch of trees. This will minimize any kind of impacts to the environment. Then if you follow to the north, you will notice uh, it leading up to the building. One of the components that we are looking at with the overall renovation of Crown Point is to bring those showers that used to be in the basement there, bring them up to be restrooms. And these restrooms would allow us access to have people coming in from the outside or from the inside, and they'd be lockable dual locking systems so that if Crown Point Community Center is not open, they would still have access to be able to do, uh, to be able to act, to get into the facility there. So that is the overall design concept. On February 14th, uh, we accepted bids for this project. Um, we had an overall number of bids at six, which uh, I'm pretty, Pretty excited to get that many bids. Um, the low bid was from Burkett Construction, and that amount was $653,060.44. That is approximately 10% under the cost opinion that we had of $721 and $25. So uh, the recommendation from Snyder and Associates, which is the engineer for this project, is to accept those bids and uh, we hope to move forward with uh, a pre-construction meeting yet this spring and develop a timeline. Thank, any questions? Any questions for John? John, was there any speculation as to why the bids came in 10% lower than? I think the general, from what I'm hearing from a, a couple of different engineers are the general construction bids are a little bit lower right now. Um, I don't know if Matt's had any bids coming in lately, but we'd be bidding everything out right now. Generally, it's a little bit more favorable right now. Good. It was a good construction year last year, so I think more things got finished up in the fall. So, John, um, the two tennis courts are those roughly where the two existing tennis courts pretty are pretty close. Today? Yeah. So, will that all of that the like the existing surface be? removed it, everything will be removed the entire site will be graded to to allow for proper um, flow of water um, there'll be subsurfaces put in some subsurface drains to allow for all the water to leave that area and how will it be fenced will there be kind of a dividing fence between the tennis yep. so that if you hit the, a tennis ball it's not going to roll all the way to the end of the road. there'll be a full fence obviously around there'll be a fence between the tennis courts and the pickleball courts, and then there'll be fences between each pickleball court. Okay, great. Other questions for John? I, I wish I would have caught this sooner, but we probably should do something for people on their bikes. There will be, okay. yeah. Yeah, there actually is gonna be, it's not on this, this is a, actually a concept from last November. Um, there's going to be a, a trail or a sidewalk leading off the trail right there, leading around to near the benches, and there'll be um, bike stations there too. Um, we're still working on one final piece that may be a, a change order, and that is we have water access close. We're thinking about bringing a drinking fountain right there at the site. So when this comes to the point of like, a, will there be a site plan that will come back to the council? Similar, just so if nothing else, then we would have like a actual visual. Of yeah, yeah, we can we can bring that. So there. you can see where the bike stuff is. Yep, and all the, exactly. We can do that. Not that we have to vote to approve, but it's just nice to sometimes sure. see what the final, as opposed to this, which is a little bit yep. more, uh, a little theoretical. Sure. Any other questions for John? I do want to say one more thing, and I want to thank publicly the mayor and, and Janet for work over the last couple of weeks that uh, we've had a chance to work with a couple different grant foundations and that moving forward with requests for this project. So we currently have two requests out and a third one about ready to be submitted for. Cautiously optimistic, yes. we'll get some grant, dollar, grant dollars to help us do this. <laughs> Any other questions for John? If not, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to address the council on this item? 
Seeing none, we will close the public hearing at 819. I just have one last one question as well, whenever that's appropriate. Uh, sure, sure, go ahead before we. I mean, I, you can close the public hearing. I didn't mean to interrupt that process. I did. Okay. okay. I was just going to see if we, I, I, I was wondering whether or not your question would be appropriate after we uh, be make a motion. That'd be fine. Yeah. Okay. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 23-46? So moved. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? So, and maybe you mentioned this and I just didn't catch it, but do we have kind of a, a some track record with this Burkett construction? We don't, but uh, Snyder Associates have had some success with them. They've done somewhat similar type projects with okay. them. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Any other questions? Discussion? Seeing none, we have a motion and a second. Sam Bolt, please. Evans. Yes. Cope. Yes. Burkhart. Yes. Martin. Yes. Motion passed. <laughs> Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 23-47? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Sam Bolt, please. Cope. Yes. Burkhart. Yes. Martin. Yes. Evans. Yes. Motion passed. Do we have a motion to to approve resolution number 23-48. So moved. Second. No motion and second. Discussion? Sam Bolt, please. Martin? Yes. Evans? Yes. Pope? Yes. Burkhart? Yes. Motion passed. Great. Thank you. Thank you, John. Moving on to the consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. No motion and second. Discussion? Sam Bolt, please. Pope? Yes. Burkhart? Yes. Martin? Yes. Evans? Yes. Motion passed. Non-consent agenda, item 7A, consider the following items relevant to the gateway crossing at 5260 Merle Hay Road, resolution number 23-30, approving the site plans as submitted by Butler Engineering Consultants on January 18, 2023, and resolution number 23-31, approving a stormwater management facilities maintenance agreement. Okay, give me one second to pull up some exhibits here. <clears throat> Uh, Chris Christensen has submitted site plans for an 11,717 square foot single story commercial building housing six tenant suites at 5260 Merle Hay Road. And the building is set up, as you can see on the overhead, uh, for a drive through at each end of the building. And the site has an existing full access at Merle Hay Road, but can also be accessed from Pitch Parkway, Pitch Parkway being the new Loop Street that was constructed with the uh, uh, Merle Hay Road Improvements Project. <clears throat> Um, so that it has an existing access at Merle Hay Road. It can be accessed from Pitch Parkway, but it can also be accessed um, from the north over the two north adjacent properties by access easement. Uh, proposed architectural materials. I'll try to get down to the architectural exhibit. Proposed architectural materials include brick veneer, vertical metal siding, and vertical composite siding. Um, with regard to the vertical metal siding, our code allows use of architectural steel panels, but that term is not defined anywhere in the ordinance. Uh, in the past, the council has accepted metal panels and commercial applications when uh, the elevations indicate no exposed fasteners and generally no raised or recessed ribs. Um, I do want to point out that the proposed metal panels have a standing seam. And I'm simply uh, bringing that to your attention. You can see in the uh, the top photo there, it's it's the um, panel all the way on the left. That's what you would be approving here tonight. Um, I'm only bringing it up because I am asking you to acknowledge that um, acknowledge that in a condition of approval. Composite wood aesthetic siding is another proposed material that needs some additional consideration. Uh, it is shown as 36% of the building's south elevation. Composite siding is not listed as a permanent material under our code, and its use is limited to 25% on any one elevation. Uh, the council does have precedent for accepting materials that are not listed as permanent materials in the code in percentages greater than 25% when the applicant can demonstrate that the proposed material is of comparable strength and permanency as those materials that are on the list. 
Um, the applicant did provide a sample of the material and it's on the council dais tonight. Um, Madam Mayor, I set that beside your spot uh, before the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> if you'd like to pass that around, this is um, an example of the composite wood aesthetic siting. Um, the materials made from scrap wood and wood shavings, which are compressed and bonded together with resins. The end result is rotten insect resistant. It has longer durability compared to natural wood. So natural wood would be limited to 25% of a building surface. This is a different product. I'm asking you to consider um, allowing it over a percentage greater than 25%. They're proposing 36% of the uh, south building elevation. <clears throat> The open space planning requirements of code require 11 trees and 16 shrubs, and the site plans are in compliance with 11 trees and 83 shrubs. In addition, street trees are shown along Merle Hay Road and Pitch Parkway. Uh, parking is also in compliance with 63 spaces provided. Uh, there's a sheet on the site plan that shows stormwater will be, be retained in an underground retention basin. And if you look at the overhead here, it's it's uh, generally located in the southwest corner of the site under the pavement. <clears throat> and this site plan was presented to our planning commission on January 30th. They did recommend approval subject to a number of minor conditions. I'm happy to go over any of those conditions in detail if you wish. Um, tonight, patiently waiting for us to get to their item is uh, Tom Trapp, apartment Trapp Architects, and the applicant, Chris Christensen. So if you should have any questions for them, we can call them up. Um, to address those. If you have any questions for me, I can answer those now. Do you also have any questions? Um, yeah, I have some questions. <clears throat> Aaron, uh, first, uh, detectable uh, warning panels and curb cuts. I see there is a access from the Pitch Parkway sidewalk uh, to the south ele elevation, but I don't see a corresponding uh, handicap ramp right there next to the building where the handicap parking stalls are. Um, it seems odd to me that if we're going to provide the handicap parking stalls so nicely convenient and centrally located that we would then require someone in a wheelchair to have to go all the way to the end of the building to get to a ramp. I don't believe this is under uh, Johnston's ordinances, but would this not be under ADA to provide convenient ramps located adjacent to handicapped spots? And, and I certainly see your meaning there. Um, here's the curb cut that allows a, a pedestrian to transition from that um, trail on the north side of Pitch Parkway. Um, there's a curb cut there that allows them to transition down to the pavement level. Um, you're looking for a similar curb cut at this location, if, if you can see where my indicator is. On yeah. The, yeah. We are somewhere in that facade would be nice. Uh, Tom, uh, I, I, it certainly makes sense. And if that's something you would like to impose as an additional condition, that's something we can do. Hi there, Tom Trapp, Hartman Trapp Architecture Studio. Uh, 1011 Locust Street, Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, adding a, a curb cut for an ADA ramp in that location is, is definitely possible with the depth of the sidewalk um, or it could transition up. Uh, that's something that's easily remedied in, in the site plan as we move forward for it. Be great, thank you. Um, and then uh, there is missing another detectable warning panel on the curb where Pitch Parkway meets Merle Hay Road, is that because that curb in ramp is already installed? Those are already present. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Um, going on, <laughs> I'm not sure where I saw it, but I believe in reviewing our uh, updated, proposed updated uh, zoning ordinances and regulations, we talk about screening uh areas where there is uh parking being uh stacked for like a drive through um do you know what i'm talking about so here we have we have a major street merle hay road and the facade that faces merle hay road is pretty uninteresting it does have the one service window and then we have a limited shrub bed 
don't we have more language uh, about screening where cars are stacked like that? In the current code, there is no language to that effect. Um, but certainly if that's something that you want to beef up in that location, um, they do have this. I, I so you're speaking about the east elevation. Then. Yes, I am. And, and actually, maybe you should scroll down to the east elevation. I will ask um, perhaps the owner. I mean, it's it's a beautiful building. And I have no issue at all with the composite materials that were presented or the metal siding, but it's almost like the front door of this building faces south, which kind of makes sense because that's where the major traffic will come from. But the Merle Hay Road is our major road. I, I feel quite protective of Merle Hay Road. People here on the council know how I feel about Merle Hay Road, that we need to continue to beautify it. And this is not the uh, east elevation. If you show us the east elevation, there we go. it's kind of bland. So I'm wondering if there's anything that could be done to make that look a little more appealing. And maybe the plant material could be um, perhaps more four season because the Iraqi black beauty shrubs uh, are not evergreen. So I'm not requiring this unless my fellow council feels the same, um, I'm suggesting that maybe a little extra attention to what is Merle Hay Road would be very appreciated. And that's all my comments. Yeah, it is, it's kind of interesting because the building is set at a, I mean, a 90 degree angle to Merle Hay Road. But in the elevations, it's presented as southeast, southwest, northeast, and northwest. I'm not sure why that why that's presented that way. When the building, if, because you're not going to have a if you're driving down Merle Hay, you're going to look at it at the east side, not the northeast side. But uh, yeah, typically just for architectural renderings, we we have them askew so you can understand kind of the depth of the facade, if everything was straight on, which you don't typically see most buildings in a straight on perspective, you're always coming at them from an angle. If you're coming north or south on Merle Hay, you would be seeing more from the corner or more from uh, that, that southeast viewpoint. So you, when you're viewing it, you're never very rarely seeing a, a straight on elevation. So we use those for reference for constructability and calling out materials. But if we scroll down, a little bit further into the perspectives that that gives you a little more of a three dimensional appearance of the building and on what is trying to create more of a, a commercial attraction uh, to connect with that new road uh, to the south and, and still be able to address the needs of, of the tenants as a commercial uh, viable building and and increasing that exposure. So the southwest perspective. Um, so that you wouldn't be seeing that from Merle Hay. You'd be seeing the Southeast perspective from Merle Hay. Correct. In the Southwest, you know, that's another kind of main kind of anchor tenant space. What's around with for the, for the uh, ring road around. there. And the signage as it's outlined on the building kind of being on four sided Aaron, that's consistent with kind of city. Um, yes, yeah, so you can have signage on um, any all four sides of the building, um, as long as you work within the constraints of the square footage it's allowances. All, everything yeah. they propose yeah. is within kind of the. And I, I would I would agree with Councilperson Martin uh, that the building materials are I have no issue with those, and I I think they're they're aesthetically very pleasing and will be interesting to uh, and a nice addition to Merle. Can I ask the architect uh, uh, just for some clarification, if possible? The the first of which is, if I am reading these plans right, and I don't do this for a living, so that's why I'm relying on you. Uh, the trash, uh, albeit uh, screened, will be visible from Merle Hay Road. Uh, yes, it, it's on that northwestern corner. We have tried to add some planting there, but really that location for the trash enclosure was not only 
related to user safety, but also vehicle access. Um, as you know, with the tenant spaces, we considered a few other locations that were, uh, you know, also equally visible. And so this seems to be the, the best option as, as far as how to address the user needs as well as accessibility. So on that, on that same train of thought, however, can you explain to me on the, I'm gonna say the west side uh, there is that drive-through that's prescribed. Um, how would one enter that drive-through and, and what would happen if the stack backs up in front of that trash? Uh, in other words, I'm worried to some extent that that uh, drive-through will back up and actually impede the exit of the other drive-through as well as impede access to the trash. I, I, am, am I wrong in that assumption? Well, access to the trash, as far as day-to-day -day users, there's a pedestrian door on the west-hand side, so you wouldn't always be going through the, the main doors, and usually the trash service is kind of on off business hours, so any sort of stacking that would happen for that specific drive you, drive through wouldn't encroach or impede any sort of service in that area. Now, the stacking for that western drive through you know, we're, we're talking that that would be in the range of probably 10, 11, 12 cars before it would be an issue for the other drive through to exit uh, to Merle Hay going to the east. And we've tried to have this west drive through accessible, not only from people entering off of Merle Hay at that north entrance, but being able to come from the west and loop back in. That's why that, that's kind of a larger kind of opening there. Um, as you know, trying to make sure the, the traffic in this overall plan just flows as smoothly as possible, trying to separate pedestrians from vehicular traffic as best as possible with, with two drive-through locations on one on each end of the building. I definitely appreciate the fact of trying to isolate vehicle traffic from pedestrian traffic, because I do envision either from the park and from Ignite in that space, and, and clearly that's your intent as well. Um, is there a uh, drawing or diagram in here that indicates what that turn radius would be if you're approaching from the west to try to enter into that? Um, I don't believe we have a vehicle turning diagram in this uh, drawing, but uh, we did widen that drive up at the north, knowing that there, there is potential for all different scales of vehicles to be able to have to make that turn, and that was something that we did review. Okay. Other questions, Council? And so just sort of looking at that drive-through number two, I just want to make sure I understand. So it kind of, it, it bends around the north side of the building. Is that, am I reading that right? Are you talking about the west drive-through? It, it says drive-through two on your diagram. Yes, yes, that, that's the, the west drive-through. So if, you, if you're coming in from Pitch Parkway, so you enter in Pitch Parkway and you take a left, an immediate left and go around the building, you'll go around and then you'll have to do almost about a 360? Uh, just a, yeah, just a 180 kind of a 180, turn. okay, yeah. Um, but if it's really icy, it could be a 360. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that, but that's kind of, I'm reading, I'm reading that, right? And, and the, is the purpose for that is just to elongate that, your, the, the, your Back. stacking. Yeah, yeah, because, just wanting to make sure. Because otherwise, if it was just straight, it would they would be turning and it would be a much shorter uh, stacking exactly line. okay other questions comments anything else Aaron um, I have nothing more to add <clears throat> Of course, I did send a notice to uh, adjacent property owners and I've received no comments. <clears throat> okay, if there's no other questions or comments, do we have a motion to approve resolution number 23-30? Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? I just want to verify we're approving with the comments that are in there as, you know, as a lot tie agreement and Tom, uh, talking to the neighboring pizza restaurant about the access, all of that is 
part of what we are approving tonight. Right. That's those are um, recommended. Uh, those can be recommended from the planning commission. Um, there's gosh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 or so conditions. Okay. Um, none of which are uh, a lot of them are standard. Um, okay. Just, yeah. That's all. I, that was my only question. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Sam Bolt, please. Martin. Yes. Burkhart. Yes. Cope. Yes. Evans. Yes. Motion passed. I think it ended up. Thank you. Do we have a motion to approve? We have another resolution for you, Chris. <laughs> Unless you don't want that one. Stop, <laughs> Pull me back in. I'm like, come on. <laughs> Let's try the let's let's just try this. <laughs> Give us a shot. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 23-31? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion. Could be close. <laughs> Sam vote, please. Pope. Yes. Burkhart. Yes. Martin. Yes. Evans. Motion passed. Yeah, thank you. Moving on to 7B, consider the following payment to Polk County for the Trestle to Trestle Bridge construction and aesthetics cost. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Let me bring this up. So with the Trestle to Trestle Bridge construction completed, the city received an invoice from uh, Polk County for Johnston's shared cost of the project. Um, in our 2080 agreement, Johnston committed up to 375,000 for the aesthetic improvements, um, the entry features, the lights on the bridge, um, and 200,000 towards construction of the bridge. And Johnston would share 30% of all change orders. 30% was shared by Polk County Conservation, and then Polk County covered the other 40% um, for change orders and final quantity adjustments um, during the bridge construction. Uh, after receiving the first invoice, we noticed a, a small discrepancy. Uh, city staff worked with Polk County staff and <clears throat> got that corrected for a total invoice of $606,054.59. Um, with the project being completed and it's over the projected initial cost, the city will need to transfer additional $31,055 from the local options sales tax and service or local option sales and services tax to the capital improvement reserve fund. Be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Matt? Matt, this is not a question. Yes. To comment. I shared this with um, oh, Rich Leopold some time ago. The bridge is beautiful. The lighting is wonderful. It's just that I think we're missing some lighting. On the back sides? Yeah. On, well, particularly if you're seeing, looking at it from the interstate. The one, you know, the south end is lit. The north end, as you face from the interstate, is not lit. And it just seems to me both ends should be lit when you're coming down the interstate at night. I think we're just, it just aesthetically, I, I just, it doesn't quite look finished. Right. The waves are, should be lit on both sides yeah. of the waves. Yeah. Right. At least it, as you're at, seeing at a, it from right, the interstate. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. And we can, we can approach. Yeah. See what it costs. Have that conversation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The only other thing, Mike, do we need to mention the, uh, the news report on the trestle to trestle, just in case the council gets questions on that. Yeah, we certainly can. Well, why don't you just? Share I know that Janet shared out a, a story about the trust trestle. I, I know there was confusion. They actually showed the bridge itself in a report that part of the trail in the city of Des Moines is being closed. Well, the bridge itself is not being closed, but Mid American Energy is doing some power line um, upgrades that is necess necessitating a section of it to be closed. It'll be closed through early uh, May, uh, and it's closed now. How far south of the? Um, it, it's yeah. Lower Beaver Trailhead, all the way down to 
Um, Madison. For three months. Yeah. yeah. Can I get a little bit of clarification on some numbers here real quickly? Uh, Matt, you, you had read and as indicated in the overview uh, that we need to transfer $31,055 from uh, local option sales tax. There is an attachment that was provided with this item. Um, if I interpret that, that gives indication of $21,054 that makes up the 30%, it, wh where is that other $10,000 needed? Very good question. The other 10,000 came with the aesthetics. They, the bid came in, it was a lump sum bid of $385,000. Okay. So there was an additional 10,000 for the aesthetics. Great, I see that now, thank you. Any other questions? Do we have a motion to approve payment to Polk County for the Trestle to Trestle Bridge construction aesthetics cost? So moved. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Sam Volt, please. Burkhart? Yes. Cope? Yes. Martin? Yes. Evans? Motion passed. Item 7C, consider the following items relevant to the final plat for courtyards at Windsor, located south of Windsor Parkway and west of Thomas Avenue. Resolution number 23-51, approving the final plat for courtyards at Windsor. Resolution number 23-52, approving a stormwater management maintenance agreement for, for courtyards at Windsor. Resolution number 22-290, approving a development agreement regarding parkland dedication for courtlands, courtyards at, at Windsor. Aaron. Uh, the Courtyards at Windsor is an 82 unit detached association home project located over 21.67 acres. It's on the south side of Windsor Parkway. Uh, the preliminary plat and site plans were approved by the Johnson City Council last spring and the developer is now seeking approval of the final plat. Uh, all the streets and utilities within this plat are private except for a section of public sanitary sewer main constructed under Northwest 90th uh, Street. Northwest 90th Street being the easternmost um, north-south street connection in, in the development. Uh, that section of sewer is public to allow for extension of sewer service to serve the south adjacent property when it develops in the future. Uh, of course, when a project gets to the final planning stage, uh, it's largely procedural as the Planning Commission and Council have already worked through the various stages of the project from the rezoning to the preliminary plat and site plan approval. Um, so tonight's action is, is um, just a relative formality. Um, staff is recommending approval subject to a number of standard conditions. Also, any questions for Aaron? Aaron, has the city received um, any elevations? I, I, I realize that, that this being a residential area that usually elevations don't come to us, but just didn't know. If um, we would have, when we did the um, site plan approval last spring, we would have seen elevations at that time. We, okay. Yeah. Can you just mind circulating those? Yeah, I will. Okay. Um, yeah. I, uh, Aaron, I have a couple of questions and I, I apologize. I can't remember. There was discussion about pedestrian connection to the surrounding neighborhoods. Was any, did that go anywhere? like to the specifically off that street going south. I know that we said that they didn't have to build that street going south into the next neighborhood, but did we ask for a pedestrian connection or a future connection at any point to the south or to the west? No, we didn't make that a requirement at the time. Um, if you remember the they are constructing a trail on the south side of Windsor Parkway um, on their plat um, that'll get pedestrians from the western edge of their project um, all the way over to the eastern edge of their project. So that'll be a trail section on the on the south side of, of Windsor Parkway there. Um, but we didn't require a trail connection through. I think what you were talking about is on the west adjacent subdivision, there's a, a small, you can see, a small little pie shaped lot there. I think that's uh, under ownership of the city of Johnston and that was intended um, to be a pass through to a park parcel here when mm -hmm. this was, uh, we had planned a park parcel in this vicinity uh, in the past when the plans to uh, develop that park parcel went away, of course, because of the expansion of the, the park just to the east of this. Um, 
I guess the the need for that connection through here kind of went away as well. But we we didn't make it a requirement at the time of the preliminary platter site plan. I think that was a lost opportunity. Um, maybe not so much here on the west side, but uh, I just feel that there will be people wanting to circulate uh, from this development and not just want to go out to Windsor Parkway and go east or west. But um, uh, like I say, a lost opportunity. My other question is about, there's quite a bit in here about uh, the tree plantings, about uh, the buffer, about bond requirements uh, to make sure that the, the buffer is installed. Uh, it talks about open space required landscaping. Is that shown on the plans? Because the only landscaping that I see is the existing uh, plant material. Right, and so that would be shown at the preliminary plat stage. A final plat really is, is a more of a clean document okay. with just the lot dimensions and things of that nature. Um, so yes, there was... Um, there are some buffers that are required to be installed. The applicant's bonded for those. Um, so we do have bonds in hand um, to ensure that those get installed. Um, and I believe as each individual unit is developed, they're going to be installing two trees on each of those lots. So you'll see some of those open space plantings going in as each home is built. And it came up during the review of the ordinances when we started talking about like a development like this that has a major requirement of buffer that these individual houses will be built. Uh, there will be a townhome association. Let's say it's five years in the future. It's all built out and the buffer starts to die. That goes back to the townhome association to replace those trees. It's part of their if it was part of their approved site plan, then they're responsible, responsible for maintaining those in perpetuity. And there is an association. These are these are association homes. Um, so there is an association in place that would have that responsibility. Okay, thank you. Right. So Aaron, in the middle of the development, is, is that a like a detention pond or two detention ponds? Yeah, let me get a grading exhibit here and it might help. Um, each of these sheets shows it, but it's just not one total sheet here. Um, you can see there's two basins that are in the center that, of that out lot. Um, that's gonna, going to serve their stormwater detention requirement, but also there's some um, walking paths that go between these two basins. You can, you can see here, there's a flat graded path at the, between the two basins. So it's it's a site amenity for their residents to um, you know dog walking path. There's some paths around those um, basins, but that yeah that empty lot you see in the middle of the plat is where the stormwater detention is. Is that path path paved or not? No, it's not intended to be paved. It was going. It was intended to be more of a rough surface. Okay. Um, yeah, like grass or yeah just... grass. Yeah, it's hard for me to just looking at these. To detect the existence of the path, right, and and um, you know that's when we look at the preliminary plat and the site plan, you um, have better exhibits that might indicate some of those things. At this point, where it's, it's really just uh, we've gotten through all of that, and we're just creating the lots now, so they can begin uh, selling the lots and developing them. So, so. I'll just have to hop back to an old. <laughs> yeah, I can circulate the uh, preliminary plat. And on a site like this, it is a really busy site. There's, I mean, there's 80, 82 units in here. Um, it's not, you know, if, if this were a 12 lot residential subdivision, it, there wouldn't be nearly as many lines on the plat and it would be a little easier to. Uh, is there a clubhouse or? There is a clubhouse and it's, uh, it'll be located here at the northeast corner of the of the property. With the pool, it looks like. There is there is a pool. Um, it says, I think it says lot one right there in the very so. northeast. <laughs> <laughs> My birthday still didn't qualify. Other questions? If not, do we have a motion to approve resolution number 23-51? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Further discussion? Cindy, vote please. Councilmember Cope? Yes. Evans? Martin? 
Yes. Yes. Motion passed. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 23-52? So so moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Cindy vote, please. Councilmember Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Burkhart? Yes. Cope? Yes. Motion passed. And do we have a motion to approve resolution number 22-290? So moved. That might be a mistake. It I think it should like it say doesn't... should say 2353. Um, in the recommended action here, you approved 2351, 2352, okay. and it should say 2353. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 2353? Uh, so moved. Second. Further discussion? Can you vote, please? Councilmember Martin? Yes. Burkhart? Yes. Cope? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Motion passed. Thank you. Item 7D, consider approval of collective bargaining agreement contract between the city of Johnson and Ask Me Local Union number 3861 for July 1, 2023 through June 30, 2028. Uh, good evening again, Mayor and Council. Um, we reached tentative agreement and um, the Ask Me unit has um, ratified that tentative agreement. If you read the staff report, the one thing I wanted to point out to you is that we did originally have two, um, two separate collective bargaining um, certification groups that were under one contract for ASME. Due that due to the law that was changed here a few years ago, which time flies, so I can't remember exactly when we redid the public um, chapter twenty, but they have to recertify um, by a vote each time um, they have to uh, come up for a new contract. And one of the um, units that had about eight employees, I believe, in it uh, failed to pass that recertification or verifying of their unit. So we only have one remaining AFSCME union unit, and that's what we negotiated the contract for. That includes our public works laborers, our parks laborers, um, the public works parks administrative assistant, and um, I believe that's the mechanic. Excuse me. And when I say public works, I'm talking streets, water, sewer. So we met with them one afternoon. We um, reached a tentative agreement within less than two hours. And it's a five year contract, 4%, 3%, and 3% in the last two years open for wage and insurance purposes. Uh, there's some reclassifications of positions, partially because of the um, contract or the verification and, and um, non-verification of the union again, but also um, clarifying. And now we always had just maintenance worker ones or a crew leader. And your only um, opportunity to move up in any of the parks or public works departments is to become a crew leader. And we have like three of, I mean, there's only three crew leaders in the whole city. So the, um, thought that they could advance, advance themselves by getting further certifications or um, licenses and things like that wasn't very successful. So we um, broke apart the maintenance worker true crew leader position, have reclassified that job description. And now within the same class where our mechanics were, we've added a maintenance worker too. And then the crew leader is still step five. So we still have the same number of grades of, of employment or of positions, but we separated that a little bit. There's going to be um, benchmarks that the employees have to make to be able to move through the system. Um, we are going to agree on those benchmarks together. Um, Matt has already laid out and we've informally talked to them about uh, process he wants to use through I believe it's Iowa State Extension and um, some things like that for the street department. But then there's some of those would also apply to parks workers. So we have time to work through that before July 1st. They, uh, we have a very good working relationship with that union and they agreed to all that and um, well, we're good to go, I guess. Unless you have questions. I also have any questions? Mayor, I do. Teresa, uh, under one of your attachments, it, it suggests that grade one is being uh, stricken. Well, um, that there's, um, let me get to the, my own document. 
um, grade one only had a secretary reception position in it, and that was in the other the other unit, unit that, that didn't, didn't verify. So, so we're just removing that. Okay. So there. So now there'll be two, three, four, and five. So it used to be one through five. Now they'll just be two, three, four, and five. And we've um, learned that changing that number is quite emotional for employees. So that will still remain that number. That's, you beat me to the question. Thank you. <clears throat> Other questions, council? How many employees are covered by this contract? Uh, I thought we'd be asking me that. 20, probably 35. 30? 35 or so. So all water and wastewater? All water, all wastewater, or other than if you're a crew leader. So Shane isn't. Um, no. Car. Excuse, I, didn't, I shouldn't have said crew leader. I meant superintendent. So like Shane Kinsey, Scott Cherry, right. Matt. And at Parks, it's John and Nate and public, Alyssa. And I mean, is public works, public works is all underwater, wastewater. I mean, our. Streets, water, wastewater is all under map. Streets, okay. But so the streets, so that so your thirty-five people includes your streets, water, sewer, and parks. Okay. It it doesn't include like our construction inspectors. They were part of that group that did. They're out. So I'm thinking like the guys who operate the snow plows. Okay. Yeah, those, no, those are all covered under this. And when we checked their comparables, um, we weren't as far off from their comparables. Um, they probably could have. Could have asked for a little more and had the right hmm. to give a little more. We went back with this and they said, okay, we uh, are. We appreciate their service to the city. Yeah, they Absolutely. did a great job for us. Other questions? I mean, the company, I don't want to say that, our, I mean, it's not like they're underpaid. I don't want to certainly tell you that, but they aren't like our police officers that were so um, far off the comparables is what I was trying to say. Any other questions or comments, counsel? Not, do we have a motion to approve the collective bargaining agreement contract between the city of Johnson and AFSCME Local Union number three, 3861. So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Further discussion? Cindy, vote please. Councilmember Burkhart? Yes. Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Motion passed. Sure. Item 7E consider approval of claims in the amount of $1,738,316.99. Move approval. <laughs> second. <laughs> motion and a second. Discussion? Cindy Vole, please. Councilmember Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Burkhart? Yes. Motion passed. City Administrator staff comments. Mike? I have no reports this evening, Mayor. Anything from staff? Councilman Evans? Uh, just Mike, thanks. And for the first part of the meeting tonight, explaining everything and helping try to get through that. Councilman Cope. Um, so we had a resident here tonight who mentioned the sidewalk meetings that we held a week ago Monday. Um, and so there were two meetings, uh, all for residents of Green Meadows. We had probably, I mean, I would say maybe 30 people attend both set, uh, each session. So a total of 60 folks are very well attended. And it was a, I mean, a couple of just kind of takeaways. One, uh, we have just great residents in our city. I mean, a lot of people, the people came into the room uh, with a lot of questions, a lot of, um, they didn't, I mean, you know, uh, their level of understanding of the role of sidewalks and who pays for what. I, I mean, I think we all, or that's always kind of a, uh, you know, not a, it's not an issue that we all have a, a have fully grasped the understanding of who pays for what. So now we're going to do this program and all that. And, um, so a lot of really good questions and a lot of questions about that I think very legitimately about, you know, people are saying, hey, uh, yes, I have a sidewalk in, in front of my home that is heaving or doesn't no longer meets the criteria. But part of that's because of something the city made me do. Um, the city, maybe there's a street tree here or there's a, 
city infrastructure that runs here or you know to what extent you know if the city's if the city has somewhat contributed to um, the, this quality of my sidewalk deteriorating will that be taken into consideration i think that's a that's a legitimate question we need to think about um but a lot of people too at the end of the meeting i think walked away with a better understanding of of the program but i do think it's an issue that we're going to need to really really almost over communicate on because it's going to this is this issue is going to touch our citizens more than a lot of things we do because we're going to in the end of the day for a lot of them we're going to be you know they're going to have to be paying a, a fair amount of money um and i just think we need to understand that and i also think it's a it's a big it's not change isn't the right word but it's a it's a big deal and it's going to be it's going to be a um it's going to impact them and so i just think we need to be thinking about that and if, if anybody else has got any other big bold ideas they'd like to propose that's going to impact the whole city now may not be the right time we need to let them sort of swallow this and let them get and get this process going and i think this is going to be one of those things where and i think we can learn a little bit from some of the other cities who've gone down this path in the metro i think there's a lot of learning that we can do but i think I think by the time I'm, I'm really glad that I don't live in the neighborhood that's the first neighborhood going through this because I think we're going to go through a, there'll be some growing pains, but I think by the time we get to the third and the fourth and fifth neighborhood we're really going to start to hit our stride and um, and and deal with it. But it is it is a you know and I know I, and this is not in any way to be critical of trees, but street trees contribute significantly to many of these issues. I, I was out walking my dogs Sunday in the Green Meadows West neighborhood, and I would come up, uh, and as I was walking the dogs, I would see, okay, here's a section of sidewalk that needs repair. And if it wasn't 100% of the time, it was well over 90% of the time that there was a tree right next to it. And I'm not being critical of trees, but we just, we have got to acknowledge that street trees contribute to this issue. And we've got to figure out and to a certain extent, those either street trees were planted by the developer when the homeowner moved in. I mean, in Green Meadows, they're all like, well, the city planted these. I mean, I'm not sure that's true, but that is the perception that there's residents. So we're going to need to communicate that. We're going to need to figure that out. I had that conversation with a couple of them out here tonight. I mean, Green Meadows, Green Meadows West, and I think probably Green Meadows North. Pioneer was probably visionary when they developed those neighborhoods. And they planted trees before even the first house was built in those neighborhoods, which was wonderful because it was one of the things that attracted me to the lot that I purchased out there. The fact that there were already trees in the parking um, on the lot that I that I purchased. So then we put our sidewalk in, and 15 years later, the sidewalk is popping up where the the roots under those trees have have grown. So, but it wasn't the city that put those trees in. But, but was, that's a misperception. Yeah. And yeah. we're going to have, and, and I, and I shared that with, with them. I mean, so the, yeah. at, at this point, the, the gap in knowledge between the residents and us is mammoth. And we need to address that. And if we don't, we're going to have big problems. So there, there's probably going to be a lot of conversation around the side, how we implement this sidewalk program it, it, before it's it, actually done. I think it, it no yeah, I, I, I think, I just think we need to think that through. We've got to yeah. think through, we got to learn from, our presentation, our communication, we got to, you know, at the end of the day, we, we, this is a process that I'm not saying we slow it down. I'm not, because I think we have to do this because we've gone 40 years in neighborhoods without addressing the sidewalks. And once we get on this cycle, it's going to make it a heck of a lot better. Um, but it's going to be a, it's going to be a significant um, kind of growing pain for us. And I think we just need to acknowledge that and be prepared to be flexible as we go through the process. Anything else? Nope. Two things real quickly. One, I serve as the city's representative of the uh, Bravo uh, of Greater Des Moines, uh, which obviously uh, we have hotel motel tax monies that go toward uh, to fund lots of arts and cultural events within uh, the metro area. Uh, our next quarterly meeting is March 8th. I know we will have another city council meeting before then, but if there's things that you would like me to bring to that meeting, please let me know. Um, certainly once the agenda gets published, I'll, I'll try to share that as well. Um, the, the second thing, a, a little more um, pointed, is 
I'd like an update if possible, and it doesn't have to be tonight, but it can be circulated as to where we are with regard to our discussions with our neighbors and Grimes with regard to the fire issue. Um, I had a very candid conversation with a city council member there, um, which uh, just brought to light, I, I think, some um, misunderstandings, maybe even some mischaracterizations, and, and certainly I, I need to know where we are in this entire process. So thank you. Councilman or Councilwoman Martin. Okay, so I'm going to speak for the trees. <laughs> Since they can't speak for themselves. 40 years is a long time. And we used to put sand down before you put down concrete. You remember those days? And tree roots are advantageous. They will go where it's easy to run their roots. So they will go underneath those sidewalks. I used to live for a couple of years in Annapolis, Maryland, a town that is something like 400 years old. And I would trip down their streets, brick streets, and I'd trip over trees and uh, broken sidewalks too. And those trees were 200 years old. So, you know, yeah, trees can heave up sidewalks for sure. But it's uh, it's kind of like, what is, what is the other, if you don't have trees, then we have no trees, no shade, no, no birds. So I know that you don't you don't dislike trees. I just want to say sometimes 40 years things like that happen plus if the ground is real compacted uh which operations back then probably weren't as good as they could be. So um I do also want to thank our city administrator and Teresa and Janet for the very excellent handout and all the work that you have put into uh, what has been a difficult mm, tax budgeting season. And we really appreciate you. You guys, I'm sure we don't say it enough. Uh, just take what I'm saying times 10 because we really do appreciate you and how well you explain it to the rest of us some of us who only know about trees and don't know about city budgets, except for what I learned from you guys. So I really appreciate it. And I don't think I have anything additionally to add tonight. So thanks everyone for your patience and hanging in there with us tonight. And uh, I think at 912 this evening, we will adjourn. Thanks all. Say we should go have a drink one of these nights after. I know. Well, but.